All right, there's a few other details that we need to talk about with t-tests. For one, t-tests are more robust against non-normality than one sample t-test. So what that means is if we do our normal distribution, or if we uh, don't know if it's normal or not, and we graph it, and we have something like this, in a t-test, in a one sample t-test, we really want to report that there's some strong skewness here, and maybe um, we, the viewer should proceed with caution. But in a two sample t's test, we don't have to worry about that as much. If you have two samples where they're like this, uh, they're more robust. So the probability will still be correct, even though uh, these might have some skewness or st even strong skewness. There's also something else called a, two, a pooled two-sample T procedure. This is an older technique. Pooled procedures averages the two sample variances to estimate a common population variance. Um, now, what this does is it's a different method. It's before they were using calculators and uh, computers to figure this out. And what they were doing is there, there was just an easier way to do a formula. So there's no reason to ever do a pooled two-sample t-test. We use a pooled in a following test in a two-proportion, but not with a two-sample t. Now, another thing we should look at is how different computer programs do t-tests. Because sometimes the AP exam will just give you a printout like this, and you have to figure out what it means. So if you're doing a two-sample t-test, and uh, it it gives you something like this from the program crunch it you can look down you can see some of it's pretty self-explanatory it defines the muse it tells you that we're testing the difference and we're checking that it's greater than that equals zero or or that it's greater than zero keep in mind this is the same thing as mu1 equals mu2 and this is the same thing as mu1 is greater than mu2 we're just adding these to the other side of the equation now this gives us our sample mean which is x1 minus x2. And our standard error, that's the everything that's on the bottom. Uh, it tells you our degree of freedom and our t stats. So our sample mean is x1 minus x2. Standard error is the whole thing in the denominator. So if you take this 5.27 and divide 3.28, you should get I got 1.606. This gave me a t-value of 1.603, but of course I rounded. So, uh, so this, you could take these two and get that t-statistic, and then you could use the degree of freedom in order to find the p-value using your t-cdf. So that's the cruncher. The mini tab gives you an n-values, gives you a mean for each sample gives you the standard deviation for each sample and gives you the standard error for the means. And then down here, it computes the difference, the 5.27, same as here. Uh, we don't uh, talk about that quite yet, but then you have a t-value of 1.6 and a p-value, and then this tells us that the degree of freedom that they used was 15. Over here, this is what would happen if we put this in on Fathom. I, to do it, you just drag one column, one category here, another category here, and then it just kicks out this uh, information. And it's pretty much the same as the mini tab, count, mean, standard deviation, standard error. And then uh, this is unpooled, because usually we should do unpooled, and uh, 1.6, degree of freedom, and p-value. All right. Now here's an example, poisoning by pesticides causes convulsions in humans uh, and other mammals. Researchers seek to understand how the convulsions are caused. In a randomized comparative, comparative experiment, they compared six white rats with DDT with a control group of six unpoisoned rats. Electrical measurements of nerve activity are in the main clue to the nature of the DDT poisoning. When the nerve is stimulated, the electrical response shows a sharp spike followed by another smaller spike. The experiment follows that the second spike is larger in the rats fed with DDT than in normal rats. This finding helps biologists understand how DDT poisoning works. 
researchers measured the height of the second spike as a percentage of the first spike when the nerve uh, in the rat's leg is stimulated. So what they did is they have for the poison rats, those are the values, and the control group, these were the values. Let's see if there was a, there was a real effect. So what we do is we plug these in. Here's two different things, your uh, fathom and your crunch it. Uh, if we just looked at crunch it, you'd have the difference between the means and the standard error. Uh, you could divide these and get your t-statistic, which gives you a low p-value. Or if we were looking at fathom, you'd mainly just concentrate on these values down here. And the one thing that's nice about a fathom printout is on an AP test, you're going to have to fill in the values. So you could do mean 1, 17.6, minus mean 2, which would be 9.49, which would be 9.5-ish, all over the square root of our standard deviation, 6.34, over our count, which is 6 plus our other standard deviation, 1.95 over 6. And now once we have this, we could just go straight to 2.991 and then report the p-value of 0.025. And here's one other way that, they, that you can see it. Uh, they give you the same information with mean, standard deviations, and standard errors. Uh, but they give you two separate values, one for equal variances and one for unequal. This one right here is for pooled t-tests, which we typically don't do. So if you see a printout like this, we're concerned about unequal variances. So we get those values. All right.